So with those announcements out of the way, uh, let's get into the afternoon program. This session is uh, transformative technologies. Uh, so this is all about technologies that have enabled amazing KIPAC science for the past 20 years and looking ahead to what's coming up to make the next 20 years possible. Uh, so the first talk we have uh, is from Aaron Rudman. Uh, he's a professor of particle physics and astrophysics here at SLAC. He is the director of the Rubin LSST camera and deputy director of LSST. Uh, and he's gonna tell us about the technological marvel um, of the LSST camera. So go ahead. All right. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to uh, be able to tell you about the camera, uh, uh, what it is, why we built it the way we did, uh, it's, and its status. And um, uh, maybe I'll just start off with a personal note. You know, my, my own scientific history is in experimental particle physics. Uh, but when I decided to make a change into cosmology, you know, KIPAC really helped make that happen. The, the community of scientists uh, all working in you know, different uh, things in cosmology and astrophysics uh, presented a, um, an environment in which it was really possible to change. And uh, you know, a number of us with a similar background, Pat here, uh, I saw Dave Burke uh, earlier and Rafe Schindler uh, really having KIPAC made this transition possible for all of us, I think. Okay. So for many years, when we talked about uh, LSST before it was Rubin and the camera, we showed these, uh, these CAD models. Uh, and as beautiful as they are, it is much better to look at the real thing. And so I think uh, Chiwei already showed the image on the left, which is actually from uh, uh, eight or 10 months ago, uh, showing the telescope mount uh, in an advanced stage of construction. And on the right is the camera almost fully assembled uh, late last year. And you can see the beautiful world's largest focal plane. So let me, uh, I wanna tell you, you know, uh, I guess if there's a theme to this talk, it's why did we build the camera the way we did? And how does that design enable the LSST survey? So that's kind of the point of the talk. So, uh, you know, as I think you heard uh, some this morning, we have ambitious goals. For Rubin and the LSST survey. We want to see the entire sky, uh, available sky roughly every three or four nights. We want to do it uh, with uh, individual images that are at 24th magnitude. Um, and then over 10 years, see every part of the Southern Hemisphere sky over 800 times. Um, we'll see billions of objects, millions of solar system objects have this in enormous database that will be here at SLAC um, in our computer center study everything from dark energy to the Milky Way to the transient sky. And as you heard, everything public. In addition, we really take advantage of the time variability. We want to compare every image to the previous images taken there uh, and detect anything that changes and send those alerts out. And I think Phil Marshall this morning alluded to the data problem. One of them is how do you filter uh, this many objects that quickly at a fidelity to really give you, you know, a pure sample of the kind of things you're interested in. Okay, so how to design the entire observatory? Well, for a survey, you want to maximize the, the phase space or the étendue in mirror area and field of view. So you want a big uh, light collecting uh, primary. Here's the primary, this is a famous picture, uh, I guess right out of the oven. Uh, showing the 8.4 diameter mirror, and then a big field of view, three and a half degrees across. And that's a combination that really is not matched. Obviously, there, there are 10 meter telescopes. There are some very wide field imagers, uh, but there's nothing that has this combination. That's really unique. And then, actually, Chiwe showed something, uh, basically a more modern version of this. Then you want to be able to take images kind of like this. This is an old a uh, model of the survey strategy. Uh, this, is, this is somewhat obsolete, but the, the graphics are nice. And you can kind of see what you would be doing. You know, that's night zero. Uh, I guess that's Z band. And then if you, if you jump ahead, it will jump to other bands. 
it will jump to deep drilling fields, et cetera, over. So there's the second night and on and on. So there we've changed filters. Now we're at a deep drilling field. So you want to enable surveying of this sort. Uh, if you sum it all up together in the six filters, this is the kind of depth uh, and uniformity that you would be able to achieve. And this is also a similar model. So how do we do that? Okay, so first of all, you want to have good optical performance over this giant field of view. So Chi Wei mentioned three mirrors is a good design. Uh, we call this a Paul Baker, uh, but the general class, it's a three mirror and a stigmat. And the third mirror surface allows you to cancel uh, or nearly cancel astigmatism out to the edge of the field of view. So that's, you know, in a, in a simple word, that's the key. The, the other tricky thing we did, very innovative thing we did was to put the primary and the tertiary on the same piece of glass. So that also had not been done before. Uh, you're locked in place, but that's a good thing. Then you only need one mount, not two separate mounts, and you don't have to worry about them moving with respect to each other. That we think, uh, I mean, you know, based on our testing, obviously that mirror exists, that's been a success. The other thing is to have a fast optical design. So we have an optical system that's uh, an F1.2 system. That is very fast. Uh, but the advantage it gives you is that the resulting structure is extremely squat. And so if you want to slew around quickly, uh, kind of the, the benchmark would be to move one quantum, so call it four degrees, in five seconds. That's our required level. You want a, a, a structure that is not too extended because you will never stabilize in that amount of time moving that quickly. So all those combined give you the ability to survey fast. So that's the fast element. Uh, here's some more pictures. There's the primary tertiary uh, after it's been figured and you can really see my eye, the two different mirrors, the very big difference in the, in the curvature from the inside primary part and the, uh, or the outside primary part and the inside tertiary. The bottom shows the secondary mirror, okay? Uh, which is, I guess, 3.4 meter, so giant in and of itself. Uh, both the mirrors are at the mountaintop. Obviously, and you see it, it's coated. The primary tertiary is not coated yet. That should happen next year. And then uh, to, to round out the optical system, we have a three lens system in the camera. And of course you need to have some refractive elements because the CCDs are cold. You've got to have them in vacuum. Once they're in vacuum, you need a window. Once you have one refractive element, you need at least one more. Uh, and the design has three uh, to, uh, to give you kind of the properties that you want. L1 is the largest lens ever built for astronomy. That's in the Guinness Book of World Records. Two, we're in there twice. Uh, you see L2 underneath, that's one structure. And then the L3 is the vacuum window. We also have filters to take images in six bands. Uh, those, are, those are in the box. Okay, so, so let me talk a little about the design. I think this is the most serious slide and then it's mostly a picture show. So the design starts with the big field of view, three and a half degree field of view. And we estimate, uh, uh, given the median uh, conditions on this peak and the design of the telescope and dome, that we'll get uh, images with a median of around 0.7 and 0.75 arc second, full width half max. At that size, you want to sample the PSF. You want to make sure you're sampled well. So a choice of 0.2 arc second is a good, a good reasonable choice. The best images should be, you know, below 0.5. We'll see how often that happens. Uh, I think it's probably impossible to do a lot better than 0.4. Maybe we'll just touch that level if there's, if you get images with, with no atmospheric turbulence, which maybe happens occasionally. So 0.2 arc seconds, that's good. 10 micron pixels is a nice modern choice for CCDs. That gives you a focal plane of just over three gigapixels. So that's what we have. Now, the next consideration is related to speed. We want to see the entire available sky 
every few nights. Uh, that pushes you to a certain uh, length of exposure. The design uh, has been uh, pairs of, of uh, 15 second exposures back to back on the same field. And so then to minimize the dead time between those two, uh, we, we designed a system capable of two second readout. So that's fast uh, for CCDs. And to do that, we needed to multiply. And so we designed CCDs with 16 channels, and that also pushed the state of the art. So two channel CCDs are sort of typical. There are some four channel models out there. We went to 16, that was on, uh, so we would get the speed we needed in 16 megapixel CCDs, uh, but that was difficult. And so the two different makers of CCDs actually had to work hard to design custom CCDs for us that had 16 channel readout. But that works. Uh, the next thing that pushes us to do is that we've got a lot of channels. So there's uh, 189 CCDs that are used for imaging. There are another 12 that are in the corners for guiders and wavefront sensors. But 189 times 16 is a big number, so over 3,000 analog channels. And pulling those out of vacuum looked daunting. It, it would be difficult to control the noise, difficult to control crosstalk, and it's a lot of feed throughs. So we chose to push the electronics to the front end, push the electronics as close to the CCDs as possible and put the electronics in the vacuum vessel. And that, so uh, I think HSC, Hypers Prime Cam does that too, but I think no one else has really done that at this scale. Uh, and that really pushes the design in a certain direction. So that's the next decision we, we made uh, that influences how we built the camera. And the final thing was to maximize the precious area on the focal plane and to really push how the, the gaps on the picture frame of the CCDs and in the gaps between CCDs to what we thought the absolute minimum was. And I'll show you a picture of that. The last design feature is connected to the fast optics. So I described why you might want fast optics, so you get a big field of view, so you have a squat structure. The thing that does though, is it gives you a very shallow depth of focus, right? So just like if you have a fast lens, you get narrow depth of field and nice bokeh. In a telescope, you'll get a, sh a shallow depth of focus. That means your focal plane has to be flat. Most CCDs are kind of potato chip shaped. And so our vendors had to work very hard to control that and make flat devices. And we had to control it every step where we built up the focal plane, we had to manage the flatness. We have no adjustability. Actually, there's no, there's no screw knobs to flatten things. We did it dead reckoned, and you'll see I have a, a plot of how well it worked. It did work well. We have an extremely flat focal plane. Okay, so that's the design, a rapid summary of all the design parameters. Okay, so let's look at some pictures. So the left is a uh, flat field uh, in the lab of uh, one CCD. Um, you can kind of see just barely, it's gain matched, but not perfectly. So you can kind of see the 16 sections, eight on top, eight on the bottom. Um, and uh, well, so you see that works. The next uh, thing you see is, the, is how we got the electronics uh, in the vacuum. And we did it by building up our focal plane out of the sub-assemblies we call rafts. That's the historical name for them. And they have nine CCDs, which you can see at the bottom. Um, and then uh, three uh, printed circuit boards that are, that are coming off the top. And then a structure, which is a combined electrical, mechanical, thermal assembly. So very tightly integrated assembly. Um, and those three boards are the controller boards. So they get fed uh, volt, uh, you know, power for the clocks and biases on the CCD, for the back bias, for all the chips on the, on the board. And the data comes out uh, eventually on a fiber, it comes basically out on one serial line per board. Okay, so it's an extremely compact package for 48 channels. Um, and then it fits in this tight grid. This is the back of the cryostat on the right. 
you can kind of see the bays in a five by five grid uh, and all the support equipment around them. So that's that's how you build up the focal plane. If we look a little, uh, uh, oh, let's see. Um, if we look a little closer, we see, you know, one of the CCDs is shown on the top. Here's the focal plane with the nine CCDs together. I showed you that picture once before. Uh, I mentioned that we worked hard to minimize the gaps. You can get a sense of that in the upper right, where you see one of, on the left, uh, one of these nine CCD units is already installed, and we're pulling into place the neighboring unit. And that's actually what this picture in the middle is from. You can see uh, no one is holding that. There are actually four rods that are pulling the raft up into place. So the gaps between the CCDs are just half a millimeter. Uh, and one of my colleagues, Kevin Real here in Kaipak, when he showed what this would look like to review committees, he had a nice slide that had two Maserati, no, had two Maseratis and another Maserati parked between them with basically, you know, half an inch to spare, which is about, you take the price of each one of the CCDs, it's, it's sort of close. It's similar to having Maseratis parked so close together. That worked, it wasn't easy. Uh, in the bottom uh, right picture are a couple of the engineers here at Slack. It's Travis Lang on the left, Hannah Pollock on the right, uh, installing the last raft. Uh, Travis got a engineering uh, achievement award here at Slack for designing the mechanism to pull the rafts into place and to make sure they don't bump, which was not, a, not an easy uh, development. Well, it worked. We put the whole focal plane together. I think Chi Wei showed a picture of the assembled focal plane. Um, let's see. Let's look at, oh boy. Okay. Uh, the throughput is going to be great. The quantum efficiency is good. I'm going to move. Zish tells me I have five minutes. I better move a little faster. Um, I mentioned that you had to build up a flat focal plane. So the, the, what happens if you're not flat, of course, is the aberrations start to broaden. There's a little bit of aberration uh, everywhere, but they get worse uh, as you get out of focus and you start developing astigmatism and coma and trefoil, uh, uh, affecting the shapes of the, of the PSF. But on the right, it shows uh, a plot. So that's data taken from a custom-made height measuring machine that Andy Rasmussen, another longtime KIPAC uh, person, developed that uh, measures the height of the focal plane. So this is over the whole focal plane. And this histogram shows the, the deviation from perfectly flat. So a four micron deviation RMS. That's extremely good, actually better than what we were hoping for. So we should be able to get the entire camera in focus at the same time. Okay, some more pretty pictures. When we finally put the focal plane together, we wanted to take some publicity images, but if you're inside a lab and you don't have a telescope, what do you get an image of? We actually never really built a, a projector. So we put together a uh, kind of the opposite of a pinhole camera. I called it a pinhole projector. And you could just put any photograph in the little box and project it on the focal plane. So it seemed uh, fitting to have uh, this famous image of Vera Rubin, uh, but then I have a sense of the absurd. So I bought a piece of Romanesco broccoli at a local grocery store and I put that in the box. And so the, the broccoli image got a lot of play and even the BBC said, Vera Rubin, super telescope, giant camera, spies broccoli. So you can't, you can't buy publicity like that. So focal plane looks good. There are very few dead channels so far, which is great. Um, and maybe here's some recent images we've taken. So it's even hard to get a good flat field over such a big area with no telescope and not much room to work in, but we can illuminate every pixel. Uh, that's what's shown on the left with uh, an LED that's sort of in the I band. Um, and you can see, you know, the global illumination is just from the projector, but you can see it's, it looks pretty uniform. It's almost all working. Looks pretty good. Uh, and then on the right is shining a little pencil beam at one point at an angle. And we are actually interested in seeing all the reflections. So you reflect off the focal plane, and then you reflect off one of the optical elements back to the focal plane. And you expect about 18 or 19 dots, which you all see, and we actually can 
infer the, we, it's a check of our alignment actually to, to look at the location of all those dots. This is too complicated to explain given how much time I've left. Anyway, we've done lots of laboratory measurements of all sorts of subtle effects that we need to correct for uh, in the pipelines. So a lot of that is set up and has already been tested based on laboratory measurements. Obviously we'll repeat it all in, in the dome, in, within dome calibrations and on sky. This has been a topic that a bunch of students both here at Stanford and visiting have worked on. So this has been fun and useful and maybe, how much time do I have? Okay, so just a few more pictures. So here we are assembling uh, sort of the final pieces of the camera. We're putting the Christ, you see the Christ down on the left going into the big camera body structure, shutter in the middle. And on the right, you see the, the lenses are now attached. Um, you might notice there's not much room in that gap. That has to fit the filter exchange system and the shutter. There's really very little spare space left in this camera. So the final challenge was actually getting it all to fit under three tons, three metric tons, and in the volume allowed. Not easy. Uh, you can see the shutter that was custom built here at Slack. Works pretty well. And then over here is the filter exchange system. I think this video is a little long. This was built by our partners at, uh, in France at IN2P3. Oh, there we go. So it doesn't have no filter there. This mechanism is going up to grab one of the filters that are sort of stored sideways. They're 80 centimeter filters. There's no room to put them aft of the beam. So they're uh, at 90 degrees on top of the cryostat. And here you see it pulling into place. Well, obviously the, uh, the R band filter, the R band. So that's the real glass filter, which we only put into place this summer. So that all works. Uh, so that's the rapid view of the camera. We are, I think Chi Wei showed pictures like that. The telescope has made a lot of progress too, uh, and is getting ready, is getting close to mounting the M1, M3, the primary tertiary mirror. And uh, we're getting close to being ready to go. Oh, I mentioned that it moved quickly. This is actually a video of the, of the mount moving in the dome. Um, that's real speed. So that is really fast for a big telescope. It's like a gun turret. So uh, I wanna close just by saying um, that one of the great things about this project has been, has been being able to work with all these fantastic colleagues. You can imagine that a project like this, just the camera, let alone the entire observatory, is the work of many, many people over many years. So this is a montage showing really people, the picture with, lo with lots of people is here at Slack. Some of these are in France. A couple of people were in Chile, Davis, uh, and a couple other places. And so it's been fantastic uh, working with all these people and my honor to represent them in uh, telling you about the camera today. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Uh, questions? Risa is the first question I see. Aaron, I don't, I don't think you were here this morning, but I showed this clip from a Slack newsletter in 2004 where um, Steve Kahn was quoted saying, we already have uh, five or 10 people working on this and it might be as many as 15 or 20. Yeah. <laughs> so how many people have actually worked on the camera? Um, yeah, I don't actually, I don't really even have a tally. Uh, there are probably a hundred people in this picture and there were definitely people who worked on the camera earlier in its history and didn't didn't come out or are not still at Slack for this photo. So it's probably 150. You know, that includes uh, technicians, engineers, um, designers, scientists, uh, sort of of all stripes. So it has been a big enterprise, big enterprise. Okay, some questions over here. Okay. So your movie of the shutter, was that real time? Yeah. 0.9 okay. seconds, so it takes 0.9 seconds. It's a substantial fraction of the exposure then. Right, yeah, it's, it takes 0.9 seconds. 
you know, it, I think you could tell it's actually dual panel. So each blade on the side actually has two panels that have to open. There's not enough room to store one of those. Uh, we have uh, already, so we have two different, so what you're probably interested in is how uniform is the exposure across the field of view. And our spec is kind of 10 uh, milliseconds and we should crush that. It should be good to a millisecond. So it's extremely good. We have both encoders and hull probes uh, on, the, on the track. Those agree well. We've uh, Schwang, I don't know if Schwang, who's an observing specialist, had a project to model the trajectory in terms of a few parameters of the, the force that's uh, applied. And that those models work basically perfectly. And the motion on the two sides is almost identical. Do you have a lifetime estimate for this thing? Yeah, so we, we built it to last uh, without any, um, uh, any uh, repair or fixing for a year. We have two units, so we have an A and a B, and we can swap them on the telescope. There is an extremely complicated device. There's not enough room to just pull it out with the crane. You have to pull it away from the focal plane, twist it, lift it, twist it. So uh, one of our other, en the engineer I showed, Hannah Pollock, designed this fantastic uh, contraption that bolts to the side of the camera while it's on the telescope, you can take it in and out. That said, actually our engineering team thinks it will do, it will do better than a year. We've, we, uh, one of the test units was uh, open and closed many, many, I think, you know, 100,000 times, really, really look good. So we're optimistic it will not need, uh, not need even a, you know, every year, but it's designed for, to swap every year and, and uh, refurbish. Okay, I thought I saw another question. Okay. Uh, yeah, when you say the focal plane is like four micrometers or whatever, like it's like a very flat, what does it actually mean in practice? And like, why, why is that? Why do we need it so flat? Uh, no, like, yes. And also like, what are the effects of it being flat? Like what does it actually do to the image? Okay, so if you're not flat, so, okay, so uh, it's an F1.2 system. So the rays are coming in, right? It's a cone, an annular cone. The rays are coming in at a big angle, 26 degrees if I remember right, on the, outer, on the outside. And so at that, at that uh, angle of incidence, if you're out of focus, you will get a disc, right? So the, the, the image size will increase significantly out of focus. And so you want to maintain flatness so that the whole focal plane will stay in focus. So, you know, if you weren't flat, the image quality would be degraded, is the bottom line. Making it flat, you know, you just have to keep track of every component. So you built up, there's a, there's a, there's a strong back structure. It's made out of something called CSIC, which is a proprietary silicon carbide made by one manufacturer in Germany. It's about a million dollar object. Took you know, many months in their oven. It has fantastic thermal and mechanical properties. That's flat to about three microns. Um, and then we have a similar structure in each raft. The CCDs uh, also flat to a couple microns and then sort of a tooling ball structure between them. So you really had to design each one of these pieces very carefully to maintain the flatness in the end. But you want it so that you're in focus. So it's for good optical quality. Okay, thank you. Oh, Stefan over there. Yes, you mentioned in passing the readout electronics. Can you say something about it? Is this, was this trivial or? No. Okay. No, so the readout electronics, um, so, you know, first challenge is density. So each one of those boards has 16 channels that can go at half a megahertz a pixel. Uh, that's, you know, so in a single board, that's very dense, that's fast, and maintaining good noise and good crosstalk is a challenge. Uh, you know, they use the dual slope integration method. So it's one of the standard methods for low noise readout. Uh, the key is an, uh, an analog ASIC to do the dual slope integration. That was uh, designed uh, by our IN2P3 partners at Paris. Um, that took, you know, 
Like any uh, analog ASIC, it took multiple iterations to work well. Uh, so that happened. The board was you know, part designed actually by uh, ha almost retired engineer at Penn plus our electronic shop here at Slack. Sven, Sven is somewhere here. There's Sven, he's even talking next. So Sven played a big part in the design, the building and testing of those boards. Uh, if you really want details, you can ask him. Um, they, uh, uh, yeah, they're challenging and they have worked very well, actually very well for us. 